We're going to be in John, uh, or the third book of John. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to that third chapter of John. And um, I'm going to go ahead and open us here in prayer. Father, Lord, thank you. Lord, we thank you for these old hymns that we can sing that are so rich and reflect what we have given to us in you, Lord, that our souls can be okay because of what you have done on the cross as you have taken the sin. Lord, we thank you for your salvation that you have given us. Father, may you bless this time. Um, Would you guard my mouth in your heavenly name? Amen. Third John, I'm going to go ahead and read that and we'll read to the end. It says, the elder unto the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Behold, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I greatly, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly start, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, not taking of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that, may we, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephus, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, Pratting against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is wicked, which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth is he that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and we know that our record is true. I have many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I, shall see, I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends in my name. I greet the friends by name. You know, John wrote this letter to the church during a time when the church was having problems. And this is in the early church, and sometimes we can hear people uh, talk about the early church time period as if uh, there was something extra special about that time. And, and it was special, but I think when they, or at times people will reference it as it's a time that we need to go back to. In fact, it was only a couple months ago I was driving on my way to work and I heard a preacher on the radio talk and say that, that if we would go back to how the church was in the early part of Acts, we would be much more fulfilled as believers. And what he was doing is he was looking at Acts chapter 2 through uh, 4 and, and, and concluding that, that that was the normal life of the church. And what he missed was, was that was, as exciting as those chapters were, that was actually the beginning of the church. It was during that time that, that many new believers were joining the church and disciples were doing miracles and, and people were selflessly selling their possessions so that they could support new members that had needs. And it truly was an exciting time. But it was the beginning. And the problem with saying that that is a model for the church today is like looking at newlyweds who have gone off on their honeymoon and looking at how their honeymoon went and saying, well, that's how the rest of their marriage should be. And we know that's a reality that can't really work because as they get home after the honeymoon, they spend some time together. Uh, The reality of their union starts to come together and they start to recognize the problems of being in this this new relationship. And so it was with the church. After the initial start of the church, there were, there were many problems. And we can see that in Scripture. I mean, consider uh, that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and that's an early church, um, during the early church time. And, and that church, as he wrote to, we see that it's divided. It's following uh, different leaders. It has members that uh, during the, the church socials are getting drunk, and, and the church as a whole is, is arrogant. The church had major problems, and, and, and the reality is, is that church wasn't, wasn't abnormal. Unfortunately, it was more normal than, than abnormal. John, in his 
uh, writings to the, 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 when he writes the book of Revelation, he sends that to seven churches, and, and each one of the churches is addressed, and of the seven, there's, there's only one of the seven that is without major problems. And so the early church had a lot of issues, and, and these problems actually came into the church quite fast. That, that pastor that was talking about how the early church was, and we should model it. He was looking at Acts 2 through 4, but if you, but if you look at Acts chapter 5, suddenly you get Ananias and Sapphira who are, who are um, misleading what they had done, and they're, and they're showing their selfish hearts, and, and God makes an example of them by, by striking them dead. And so the early church was actually plagued with sinful problems. And what happened is, is the apostles during that time and other, other leaders addressed those things and, and wrote letters about that. And it's through that that we actually get the New Testament. God in his providence took advantage of that and, and used that to lay down the groundwork that we would know how the church is to be from here until he comes back again. And John 3 that we just read is actually one of those corrective letters. John, at this period of time, he's already written 1 John, and in 1 John, he had dealt with false teachers that had entered into the church. False teaching was being proclaimed, and John had forcefully condemned it and warned the churches about it. And then in 2 John, John takes it actually a step further, and, and because of the problems of evil um, the evil teachers, the false teachers of the day, and because of the fact that when they would teach falseness, they would damage the church and, and deny the truth of the gospel. And by denying the truth of the gospel, they were basically withholding the truth of salvation to those that, that didn't know and leaving them dead in their sins. It's a horrible thing that the false teachers were. And so in, in Second John, uh, John is now telling them not even to offer these heretical teachers a place to stay. Don't give them any welcome. Withhold hospitality from them because they are so dangerous. And then we get into third, John, our our, our book for tonight. You know, John had called on leaders to protect the church from the heretics that were going about. and, And now, unfortunately, a leader in a church has taken that call and twisted it. He's twisted it for his selfish motives, and now he's... He's gone so far as that he's now treating believers and those that seek to follow after the Lord as the heretics themselves and refusing hospitality and kicking them out of the church. And so John writes to address this, and I think as we get through, we're going to see how this greatly applies to us. A little bit of background, we start in John 1 of of, uh, 3 John. It says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as, thou, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly start, thou shalt do well." John starts off this letter by writing to a man named Gaius who has been supporting visiting ministers. There's no New Testament writing at this time, and so what would happen is these ministers would, would go out around the churches and they would bring the truths that they had heard from the apostles and, and had learned from other churches and bring those out to the outlying churches and, and, and teach them what they had learned so that the people would know the truth of God. And as they were staying in the community, then they would also work as evangelists. And these men that were doing this, they thought to, or sought to, put as much of their time as possible into ministry, and so they weren't working, and and they needed support. And for this, Gaius was pleased to do. And so John commends Gaius and then reminds him that his support of these minister makes him a, a fellow helper to the truth. As Gaius has helped these ministers, he has become co-workers in their activities, and become a part of what they're doing. And it's the same with us even today. As we uh, support the church, as we support other ministries or missionaries or something like that, even though we're like, not with Michael Shelf out in India, if we're supporting him, the reality is before God, he sees us as co-workers with Micah. And so there's a wonderful blessing in this as, as, as uh, Gaius here has supported the missionaries and, and, that, and how that continues to this day is how we support others and we become a part of their ministry. And so that support is extremely important. 
But the problem is, is, is there's been one man in the church that has gotten into a position of authority that is not doing this. And so John gets to the main point of his letter here in verse 9, which is where we're going to spend most of our time, verses 9 and 10. And after commending Gaius, he gets to his main point, and he says, I wrote unto the church, but uh, Diotrephus, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church." In these verses about uh, Diotrephus, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to call him Dio because his, his name kind of trips me up with pronunciation after a little while. But, but in these verses about Dio, John uh, describes the damaging actions that come from self-love. And these verses have been given to us so that we can see how Dio acts and then be warned of the dangers of self-love. And instead of loving ourselves, focus on loving others as we should. And so John here, he introduces the issue with Dio by noting that he had written something to the church. And what has likely happened is that, is that John has sent out some of these ministers that we were talking about a second ago, and, and they went to the area that, that Gaius and Dio are at, and they come to Dio's church, and, and it would be common that, that the ministers would bring with them a letter, a letter to the person that had sent them. And in that letter would be uh, uh, an introduction, and it would tell you who these visiting men were and, and what their purpose and what they planned to do there in their community. And then there was probably some other things that John had for the church itself that John wanted to be read to the church, words of encouragement or teaching from the apostle himself. And, and so that was sent, but, but Dio, one of the leaders in the church, when he, when he gets this, he, he stops it. And he doesn't take it in, and he, and he turns them away. And think about that for a second, what he's doing. Because God used apostles to bring the teachings of Christ to the people. And in fact, it's by the teachings of the apostles that the foundation of the church has been laid. Turn with your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. There in speaking of the church in Ephesians 2.20, it says that the church is, or implies that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone of the church, but what he, what he did is he, he used the teachings of the apostles and the prophets to build onto that cornerstone as they were guided by the Holy Spirit to lay the foundation of the truths that now the church is upheld on. But Dio here is a leader of the church. He, he goes in and rejects John's letter and, by, and the, the men that are coming with John are from John. And by doing that, he has rejected the source of truth that was building up the church. And not only that, by rejecting them, he, he, he rejects John's ministers. He also rejects John in a sense by doing that. And in doing that, he rejects John's uh, apostolic, or apostolic authority over the church as well too. Dio, in this move of his by rejecting, John, by rejecting John's ministers, calls into question whether God has really set the apostles over the church, whether they really have authority over the church and are able to lay down that foundation. And really, Dio here in his move is ultimately a rejection against God's divine plan for the church. So a very, very serious thing that he's done here, right? But the thing is, is Dio doesn't do this because he's a heretic, he doesn't do this because he has the truth wrong. John's not correcting any truth here in, in, in uh, 3 John. He's not correcting any heretical views. This man, Diotrephus, he does this because of his attitude. In verse 9, it tells us that regarding him, that he loveth to have preeminence among them. Dio does this outrageous act because he wants to be first. He wants to be put first. Some translations have that, that he, likes him, he likes to put himself first. And they both have the same idea that, that in his self-love, he desires to be first in the church. He desires to have the, the highest position of authority in the church that he can. And, and it's to self-fulfill his own desire, not because he's seeking after the purity of the church. Christ is warned about this. If you look up in Matthew chapter 20, Verse 25, this is just one of many places that you can find it in the New Testament. But in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, it says this. It says, but Jesus called unto them and, and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, 
and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Among you. But whoever, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or servant. And whosoever be chief among you, let him be your servant, or in the Greek, it's slave. Humble yourselves. But Dio, he didn't heed this. And he desired to rule like the Gentiles. And so when, when the ministers of John show up with this letter, he feels challenged. And, and because he feels challenged, he turns them away. Even for a short period of time, he doesn't want to give up the pulpit. Now, it could be that that deal here, he's received John's first letter where John condemns the heretics and maybe even received the second letter about not offering them hospitality. And it could be that deal originally had good intentions and he thought, you know, there's, there's heretics out there. They're in our community. I need to protect the church as a ruler or not a ruler, but a leader in the church. And so for that reason, I'm going to be checking who comes in. And so he stood there and he checked who came in and he didn't let any of the heretics in. Uh, but the problem is, is that once the, the ministers from John, the, the apostles, show up, he rejects them as well. And what we see is that his true heart is not the protection of the church. His true heart is not the protection of the people or the protection of the truth. His true heart is how he is, how his position is. He doesn't want to give up his position. He's very self-centered. And what we see in this is we see, and we'll see it more as we get into the rest of what he does, but we see that the the self-serving attitude, the attitude of looking at myself and promoting myself first in the church or above others is just as damaging to the church as heresy is. I'm getting into that. And and John's reaction to this shows us how how bad this self-serving attitude is. In verse 10, he says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth. Now, in our English translation here, it sounds like this is uh, questionable whether John's going to show up or not. But if you look down in verse 14, he says, But I trust I shall shortly see thee. And we see that in in 14 there, you can pick it up. But but John, what he has, he has the intention, he has every intention to go and address this situation. The problem is John just doesn't know when he's going to do it. It's likely that John has other duties that he's addressing right now, and because he has these other irons in the oven, I guess, that he's got to deal with, he's got to get those things kind of settled first before he can actually go and take care of this issue. But there's a surety that John's going to go, and he's going to go, and and when he goes, he's going to address Dio's problem by simply remembering his deeds that he does. And, And what that's implying right there is that he's going to remember it before the church. He's going to speak again of what Dio has been saying. And what Dio has been doing is Dio has been a gossip. And John's going to recount what Dio has done in front of the church. And while Dio has thought that in this gossip he's been able to build himself up into position, what he's actually done is he's exposed himself and his attitude. And John is simply going to recount what he's been saying. And by recounting what he said, he's going to convict him. In the next part of verse 10 there, we get how he's gossiping. And it says that he's pratting against us with malicious words. Pratting there, the... the, the a translation of that is to talk nonsense or to babble, and malicious is just simply evil. And so here it has the idea of what he's doing is he's talking evil nonsense like a babbler against the apostle. He's, he's gossiping with, with evil intent. Dio doesn't really have any real problems with John. He can't find anything really to, to, to point out that, that the apostle is wrong with, but in his desire to push himself up above John, John he has to come up with things, and he slanders John the apostle. And this is not leadership. This is not leadership in the church at all. And when it comes to leadership in the church, we are to be careful because there's a greater condemnation for those that take leadership in the church. And part of the reason for that, or a large part of the reason for that, is because leaders can't offend or st- cause people to stumble by, by what they say. James chapter 3, verse 1 says that, um, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same man, the same is a perfect man, also able, to bri- also able to bridle the whole body. And this Dio is guilty. He has not bridled his, his body. And, John, and James goes on in that passage to talk about the specific part of the body that he's including, and that's the tongue. And Dio isn't able to control that. 
And in that James passage, we see that the tongue, as it speaks, it, it reveals the conditions of our heart. And if we have a sinful heart as we speak, that reveals a sinful heart. But if we speak graciously, it shows that we're governed by the Holy Spirit. And so a gossiper like Dio here is, a, is one who, who is revealing by their gossip that they lack love for others and that they are sinfully self-centered in their heart. Now that we all know that, nobody's going to gossip, right? Because now we start to gossip, everybody in this room is going to be like, ah, I know your heart, right? That's good. That's what we want, right? Because we don't want to go there. We fall at that sometimes when we do that, but we recognize that's not where we want to be. And so realize that our gossip just exposes the heart. And there's no power in it. The one that's gossiping thinks there is, but there's no power in it because John deals with, deals with it by simply retelling that gossip in front of the church. He's not going to defend himself. He's just going to repeat what's been said. And imagine that. Imagine if all of your gossip, if we just got up here and just repeated it word for word like, like it was said, right? You'd be, oh my goodness, you'd be shame, right? I would. There's no power in it. It's evidence of a wicked heart. It's not something that we should do. We should not follow Dio's example here. But know too that in our attempt to control that, the solution is not to commit in our hearts not to gossip less. I mean, that's good, but that, that's not really a solution. The solution is, is a renewed heart by, first of all, coming to Christ, but then, then secondly, in our hearts, committing in our hearts to the Lord, committing in our hearts to the kingdom, committing in our hearts to loving others in the church. And so Dio is way off where he needs to be. So far, he's shown that, he's, that because of his self-love, he has rejected spiritual authority that should be over him. And because of his self-love, he's a gossiper. In verse 10, we can see more of his problems. He's not content there. And he says, not content with the gossiping, neither doth he receive the brethren. The deal is gossiping about John, but at the same time, he's also refusing to accept these traveling brethren that are coming over. These ministers that are that are coming to speak to the church, uh, Dio goes and rejects them. And by rejecting them, Dio is basically um, refusing to house them. He's refusing to have anybody else house them, so they have nowhere to stay. It's not like they can go to the Hilton on the corner or whatever and, and find a room and then drive over to the church. If you're rejected hospitality, you're not going to minister in that city. And by not being able to minister in that city, the, the, the church suffers spiritually because of that, because the truths cannot get proclaimed. And the reality is, is that, that the ministers of those local churches at the time, while, while they had truth, they were also dependent on these incoming uh, ministers that they would grow as well. So not only does he, does he cut the growth of the spiritual growth in his church, he also cuts his personal growth. In that selfish desire to be first, he he causes the church to start to become immature or be immature. And the rejection of hospitality as a whole is not something that any Christian should be because we're actually called to be hospitable. Romans chapter 12, verse 13 says that believers are to be distributing to the necessity of the saints and given to hospitality. And Dio does neither. But yet we should look at that and recognize that we do not want to go there and we need to be hospitable for that is the command for us as well. And hospitality at this time is, is not necessarily how we would understand it today and in our culture today. We often think of being hospitable when we have just people over to our house, commonly friends or people that we know. But hospitality in the mindset of the New Testament world was, was a little different, actually maybe a lot different. Because of the fact that there was no place for travelers to stay and because of the fact that travelers could easily be taken advantage of once they got away from their communities, they, they, the hospitality was important. They depended on a, somebody that was willing to take them in. And what would happen is a traveler would come into the, into the new community and the new community would take him in and take care of him and then, and then that traveler would go out and tell of how this community took care of him. 
so that when this community, when they traveled, the word was that they were hospitable, so other people would offer hospitality to them. So it was kind of this back and forth, give and take, right? And so what happened in the ancient world is the understanding of hospitality, and there, or the understanding of the definition of hospitality, uh, became to take a stranger and either make him your friend, or at very least treat him like a friend. And so the idea of hospitality, of biblical hospitality that we're to imitate is not the, necessarily the idea of just having people over to our house um, or for whatever reasons, and there's nothing wrong with that, and that's a good thing, but, but the idea of hospitality in the scripture here is, is that we offer it to the people that we do not know. The new believers that come into our church or the visitors that come into our church, we, we, offer, we offer that to them. And the problem is, is that's not super common in our culture. We, generally speaking, I think, in our cultures, we are not quick to welcome people that we do not know into our spheres, into our homes, into our, you know, inner circle, right? And that's concerning, and especially when we add to that, that the desire to withhold hospitality is a feature of somebody who has self-love. And when we see those two things coming together, we realize that our culture could actually encourage us into this self-centered area. And for, so for that reason, we must work to be hospitable in this manner. We, as a church, must learn to be more hospitable or to be hospitable in the manner that our Lord teaches and not just inviting over the people that we know. I see Diane sitting there and I'm reminded of Pastor Wayne. Pastor Wayne encourages us to do this so much, doesn't he? And he's gone right now. And this is something that we need to really stand up and, and, and to do. That's Pastor Wayne's heart, and he's given us the example on how to do this, and it's something that we really need to follow through and do. And the thing is, is that if we would do that by loving others, we can work against that desire for self-love that we often fall prey to. And to be hospitable means, doesn't mean we have to have a home to invite people over. I mean, that's a nice thing to do, but, but it's the idea of being able to show love to that stranger and to make that stranger the friend or to show them the kindness that we would show to a friend is the idea. So you don't have to have a home to practice this. And note, too, that the, the New Testament understanding of hospitality is to make a stranger a friend and not necessarily to make a stranger a brother. And I say that because sometimes I've heard, and, and probably been guilty of it myself, but sometimes I've heard people that are apprehensive to show hospitality to a stranger because they're uncomfortable with sharing the gospel to a stranger. They're uncomfortable with, with, with being able to do a gospel presentation. And because of that, in the stress of doing that, then they, they step back from offering hospitality to somebody they don't know because they feel like they have to share the gospel to them. And I would say that's kind of a messed up way of looking at the situation. I think if we would, would instead focus on the Lord and say, I want to live for the Lord with all my heart, my soul, and my mind, and then I want to love the stranger as I'm commanded to, that if I love the stranger and I have the heart to want to love the Lord, that the opportunity to tell them the gospel is going to come together. That those two things will start to come to me, will mesh together. And what will happen is we will, we will share the gospel not out of a out of a, a, a feeling of duty, but a feeling of joy. And because it comes out of, a, out of a desire of joy to the person receiving it, it's not going to sound pretentious. It's going to sound sweet because it's coming from us out of a place of joy. And so don't hold back for that reason. I'm going to continue in our passage and we'll get to the final few attitudes of of Dio here, and the second to final one is that Dio wanted others to follow his bad example. In verse 10 it says that he forbiddeth them that would, meaning he forbiddeth others to offer hospitality to tra traveling brethren, and he casts them out of the church. Those that refuse to, refuse to follow uh, his example, he casts out. Uh, Dio and his desire for himself is now completely working against the Lord and building the church. 
You know, by personally refusing to take in the traveling ministers, Dio winds up hindering the spiritual growth of his own church. But by requiring the church as a whole to refuse to take them in, what he has effectively done is withheld the gospel from being proclaimed to unbelievers in the community. You know, this church that he's at is likely a home church in some community, and, and normally these traveling ministers would come and, and they would work as evangelists, but by forcing the rest of the church to do this, he just keeps that gospel from going out. This man's actions are extremely damaging to others, and, and recognize too, as I mentioned when I started, that it doesn't come from a heart of heresy. It simply comes from a selfish desire to be first in the church. Thinking of himself first and and not of others has led to this extremely damaging behavior in the church. And he actually takes it further. It tells in our passage that he also threatens to kick out believers of the church that would offer hospitality. And this is a severe punishment at this period of time to be kicked out of the church. You figure, like I mentioned before, at this period of time they don't have the New Testament. And so you have to go to the church to hear, hear the truth of God, right? There's no other way. You have to go to a church meeting to hear the truth of God. And it's also the place where you get encouraged by being around other believers. So to be excommunicated from the, communicated from the church at this period of time there, it means there's no way you're going to live the Christian life really effectively at all because you've been cut off from the truth and you've been cut off from all encouragement to live after the truth. Dio and his, his desire for himself in, in kicking people out makes it impossible for a believer to live out a Christian life. And what we see in looking at Third John here is that while heretics are damaging to the church, if we do not live out the truths that we've been given by loving others and thinking of them above us, it's just as bad as if someone was speaking heresy. You know, we can have all our truths correct, but if we don't live it out, it's damaging. And it's just as bad. This passage, I've actually been studying for a little while now, probably about a month. Maybe, actually, maybe, yeah, about a month. And when the opportunity came and to speak tonight, I thought, you know, I want to teach on this because as I've been studying this and as Pastor Wayne has gotten sick, I've thought a lot about this. Because I saw how in the passage here, how damaging it can be if a person gets into a position of authority and they love that authority or they love that position or they just have self-love. And they don't love others with a servant heart. And I sat down with my wife and I actually told my wife, if you see any of these attitudes coming up in me, you need to call me out. And the reality is, is as Pastor Wayne is is temporarily out and and a number of men throughout the church are having to step up into different positions to to cover things that Pastor was doing, a lot of men are, 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 are in positions of authority that they hadn't been before. But because of that, all of us that have been moved into these positions have to, in our hearts, commit ourselves to, to maintaining that servant heart. We cannot look at what has happened and let it go to our heads. And we must protect ourselves against this. Look at, look at the, the damage that Dio has caused in his church and recognize that, that that is a potential and that we need to flee from that. But also while pastors gone as a, as a church body, we also need to be careful because as different men have been put into different positions of authority, we may not be happy with who's in the new position, right? There may be somebody teaching that we don't care to listen to anymore. But that doesn't mean that we turn our backs onto that other authority that's been put in there. Pastor Wayne has approved all those different changes as our pastor. And we as, as the members of the church need to continue to support that. And if we look at that and we think, ah, it's not the person I like or I wish somebody else would teach or whatever, and we're not in line with it, then where we need to be is on our knees. And don't go to the next step of gossip because that's the next step, right? We need to, as a church body, we need to protect the the change that's going on here while we wait for Pastor Wayne to come back. Not gossip. Support the people that are, that are in positions right now while we wait for Pastor Wayne to get better. 
And then when Pastor Wayne came, comes back, the men that have been lifted up need to have the hearts that we all step back down to the positions that we were before and support our pastor when he comes back. If we will do that, the church will grow. It'll be strong. But if as a community, if we don't, or if as the leaders that have had to step up, if we don't, if any of us start becoming selfish, we can damage and damage the church. Dio gave us a bad example of that. So may we not follow his example. And may we as a church be known not only as a friendly church, but as a hospitable church.